Hello YouTube. Today we are continuing with the series that I inaugurated last Monday. If you missed it, the goal is to present to you guys lifters that I believe to be interesting because they pushed the natural limit extremely far and therefore we can learn a ton from their training practices and philosophies. The first episode was about Geoffrey Verity Schofield. If you missed it, it's in the description. But today I want to do something a bit different because Geoff is quite famous. He has 100k subs. What I would also like this series to be about is for me to present to you guys people, lifters, that are completely unknown, who are not famous at all, but that deserve the spotlight because they have insane physiques, but also a ton of things to teach you. And this is exactly what we're going to do today with who I believe to be the best lifter you've never heard of. A natural bodybuilder with a physique that puts to shame 99% of YouTube fitness and who has the knowledge to go with it, but that no one knows. His name is Erzoviak. I'm certain you've never heard of that name. He barely has a few thousand subs. But you'll see that in today's episode, we are going to observe the training practice of who I believe to be the natural lifter with the best physique on this platform. I can say it without blushing, his physique blows mine out of the water, it blows most people's out of the water, and most likely it also completely destroys yours. So, sit tight, we are going to study this case together, we're going to study this lifter together, and we're going to see what we can learn from that. As always, the structure is as follows. We start with a general presentation of the lifter. Then we analyze his training split and the way he actually develops his muscles. After this, we move on to the training philosophy. What can we learn from this split that we just observed? And we end the video with the highly anticipated physique critique, where I go through the guy's muscles, body parts. I give them a grade and I say what he should be working on and what is already excellent and what you can learn from these excellent muscle groups because if a guy has a great physique and certain parts are more developed, it's usually because he knows certain secrets, certain approaches to training that you can replicate as well. So let's start with the presentation. As I said, the guy's name is Erzoviak and he is French. Now, I say I'm French, but the guy is like French. He's aggressively French. If you go watch one of his videos, eventually I will plug his channel you will understand what it means to have a strong French accent. But his English is excellent, so you will have no problem understanding what he says. He's a bodybuilder, of course, and he's been training since 2013. So it's been roughly 10 years. He was very athletic because he was an athlete. So he used to swim, he did martial arts, but he never bodybuilded. He started bodybuilding quite late, and yet he got a ton of results. Not very fast steadily, but the transformation was tremendous. It's still a 10-year transformation. See, it's not one of these TikTok Instagram kid who blows up from age 16 to 18 thanks to secret substances. The guy, bit by bit, put muscle on his frame, and the, the methods that he followed is what I'm most interested about, because just like many of the lifters, he takes inspiration from the silver era of bodybuilding, a more aesthetic, a more complete, era of the sport where the physics flowed and weren't massive. It wasn't the time of mass monsters. And he likes Steve Reeves in particular, like many of you guys. But unlike a ton of dudes who jack off on the silver era, he actually doesn't just leave that fantasy in his head. He's not satisfied with just thinking about it. He actually put in the work. And he did that by replicating the methods of the guys from back then. So the training splits and the nutrition aspect of the thing he followed to a T, and he actually managed to get a physique that is to a similar level to these guys, and I would even argue maybe even better than some of the bodybuilders from the silver era. So some of the stats I can share with you guys is that he's 5 feet 7, so not super tall, but not very short, he's most likely the perfect height for bodybuilding, 180, lean, so he's around 12 to 10% body fat at 180 for 5 feet 7, that's crazy, that's a ton of lean mass, 17 inches arms, 44 inches chest, with a 28 inches waist. That is mind-blowing. My waist is 36 inches. Most people are around 30 inches. 
But if you pair the 28 inches waist with the 44 inches chest, that is crazy. Now, some of that is genetics, of course, but you'll see that his training methods also emphasize that silver era look. Then he has 24 inches legs, so not small by any means, but not massive, and a 19 inches neck. That is crazy yoked. It's a, it, his, his neck is much bigger than his arms. That is insane. Now, I'm certain that some of you at this point are already like, okay, I thought this series was for natural lifters. What the fuck are you doing? The guy is clearly enhanced. Listen up. I would put my left ball on the fact that this guy is natty. I'm certain that he's never taken steroids in his entire life. I'm not him. I'm not his girlfriend. I don't live with him. But I can sort of sense liars and I can see who uses and who doesn't. And this is someone who, based on his progression and based on his current physique right now and training methods, is 100% clean. So if he is, this means that the muscle comes from somewhere else. It comes from the way he trains. How does Erzoviak train? As I said, he follows the Silver Era method. How did Silver Era guys used to train? They did full body. Full body was the split. No one was doing push pull leg. No one was doing fucking bro split. It was full body three times a week. He does the same. He trains Monday, Wednesday, Friday. It's also the way I recommend you guys do full body. Two sessions is not enough. Three is perfect. Four is too much. How does he run his four body sessions? Well, let's take a look at his training sessions. I selected three different types of sessions and we're going to study them together to learn the secrets of the silver era training that he follows. He will start for his first session of the week with a partial behind the neck overhead press. So this is an overhead press with a range of motion that stops behind the head here. He doesn't go into too deep of a flexion. The idea being that if you go too deep with the behind the neck press, you can start getting some impingement and some problem in the shoulder. And since he does a five by five with 200 pounds, so 90 kilos, it's not something that you want. This is a case of trading range of motion for load of the, on the bar. If the trade is done properly, it actually is going to be better for health and better for hypertrophy as well. Clearly, he knows what he's doing. Then he does weighted chin-ups, 5x5 five five again, with 55 added kilos, 120 pounds. If you look at that, it's going to be around 345 pound plates. So that's really, really strong because the guy is not around 50 pounds. He's 180 for a 5x5. Five five. So with these two entries right there, I can tell you that this is someone that understands four bodies. He starts with very heavy compounds that are going to take care of a lot of big muscle groups. He weights them and he does a lot of volume. For the vast majority of the population, that would be enough for your shoulders and your upper back. You would be cooked. He doesn't stop there, however. Between each set, he does 20 to 25 reps of face pulls or bend pull apart. He does that not for hypertrophy, but for mobility and injury prevention. That is quite smart. Of course, you still get some real dot work. It's minor, but it's always something worth taking. You will get to see that Erzoviak supersets pretty much everything. He's never resting. He's moving from exercise to exercise. Even with heavy compounds, which is exactly the way I train. I do it with giant sets. He does it with supersets. Now, as I said, most people would be done because 5x5 five five is a lot of volume already. But he continues with back of sets of behind the neck overhead press with 80 kilos. So he only takes down 10 kilos from the bar. I would say that for you, that will be too much. It's too much for shoulders, but he can handle it because he trained himself to be able to handle it. This is going to be an important key of the way he trains. You'll see that some of his muscles seem to be incredibly resilient and they also so happen to be the ones that are the biggest. If you put two and two together, it makes a ton of sense why. The muscles with the best work capacity and the most strength tend to be the biggest in the physique, and the ones that lack that strength or recovery capacity tends to be lacking. The back of set continues with fat grip neutral pull-ups, five sets as well. So the back is hammered. It's 10 sets of vertical pulls. That is a lot, especially because they're weighted. Now, here, I would say that if he attempted to do anything beyond that for these muscle groups, that would be too much. And unsurprisingly, he moves on to something else. He then moves on to slingshot weighted dips. Why do you use a slingshot on weighted dips? You do that because you want to deload the bottom portion, which means you deload the shoulder because he already trained the shoulders a ton. 
and do chess. The chess is a little bit surprising because he never trained chess here. So he's leaving some games on the table, but he's getting more back in tricep hypertrophy because the slingshot doesn't really help that much at the top. So because he does weighted dips with 80 kilograms or 180 pounds of additional weight plus his body weight, if you do the math, that's 360 pounds total for the dips and he does four sets of five to eight, that's a lot of reps for that weight, he will get some massive results for the triceps. There's no way around that. And of course, he supersets that as well with wall curls. So he puts his back against a wall and he's going to do curls with an easy bar, with a barbell, whatever, which he does with 50 kilos. That is also decently strong on that movement for that muscle group, for something that is strict. And after he's done with all of these sets, if you look at the muscles that were worked in priority, it's shoulders and lats, which are completely trashed, triceps, because he did his dips in a way that actually skews the, bicep, the tricep development, biceps with the wall curls, but also the forearms, because if you, if you do chin-ups, fat grip neutral pull-ups, and also wall curls that he did at the start with fat grips, even though you did not technically work the forearms directly, they received a ton of byproduct stimulus that are going to grow them. There's no way around it. The one thing missing from this equation, however, is the chest. The chest is not trained at all on this split, and that is surprising. I'll explain later why he does it the way he does, but it's not done. Anyone who runs full body understands that this took care of torso, it took care of the limbs. What about the legs? Is Erzoviak a leg skipper? No, he just puts the legs at the end of the workout. And that is surprising, especially if you follow my ideas regarding programming. I always tell you to never keep the most fatiguing exercises for the end because it means you're going to be less performance. Once again, I'm going to explain to you later why this makes sense. But for legs on that day in particular, he does cheat style T-bar rows. This is funny because in my lat steel list, I told you guys that the T-bar row is most of the time a hip hinge. Most people don't realize the amount of legs they use on the T-bar row. It's because the lift encourages you to bend the knee and to actually hinge at the hip to use the musculature of the posterior chain. When you try to do a clean style T-bar row, you already bastardize the movement. Erzoviak understands this perfectly. He does T-bar rows for legs and for posterior chain. And he does five sets of six to 10 with seven plates. So he cheats like a motherfucker, but if you want leg development from this, that's the way to go. And this is actually his leg exercise for the day, which is of course also going to grow the yoke because the weight pulls on your yoke. If you do it cheating style, you're also going to have a more vertical torso as opposed to a clean horizontal torso, which means that the weight is going to pull directly on the yoke and it's going to be more of an upper back exercise than a lats and rhomboid exercise. Lats and rhomboids are already cooked, so he's doing it that way. I already love doing these reviews and I hope that you guys enjoy it as well. You can immediately tell from looking at the split of someone if he knows what he's doing or not because the language of programming is written in between each set. Here, I know that he gets it. He gets the way he's supposed to train his body because everything makes sense with no explanation whatsoever. Here, I'm just translating the language of programming for you guys. And he finishes that with set five, which is a triple drop set. So he does one set with six plates, then one with four plates, then one with three plates. That is incredibly fatiguing. And for the most part, I would say that this is overkill. But here it's fine. Why? This is his first leg movement of the day, and it's the most important one and the one that is going to carry the most volume. So it's okay that he does this because he doesn't have to worry about being too fatigued. He actually wraps up his day by doing Smith machine reverse lunges. So what I find interesting with his split as well is that he does some exercises you rarely see. Partial behind the neck overhead press, fat grip, neutral, uh, neutral grip chin-ups, cheat star T-bar rows, Smith machine reverse lunges, I'm certain that none of you guys do these lifts. I don't do them as well, and you rarely see them in the gym. But this is someone who's been training 10 years and he understands what works for him. Once he has found what works for him, he sticks to it. So he likes the, uh, the reverse lunge because he has knee issues. He doesn't want to aggravate his knees. We'll talk about that later too. He has found that the reverse lunge on the Smith machine grows his arm strings and glutes, as well as the adductor, without trashing the knee too much. He still gets some quad development from it. There is a there is distinct lack of quads and of chest. They were not worked on that day, even though it's technically a full body. You could tell me, well, 
then it's a bad full body. No, that is a mistake I see many people make. They think full body, I have to train everything equally. It's not how it works. You have to skew towards your priorities and towards what you want to actually grow. And we'll see that when we go to the second full body session. He does seated dumbbell press, five by five. He loves his five by fives with 44 kilograms or 100 pounds. That's very strong. Plus fat neutral grip pull-ups. Get used to it. This guy loves pairing vertical presses with vertical pulls. I do as well. I think that it pairs beautifully, just like horizontal presses and horizontal pulls go absolutely wonderfully well together. He does 10 sets of 8 to 10 with 35 kilograms. So you see that the guy prioritizes pull-ups so much that he has light and heavy days for pull-ups. On session one, he did less reps with more weight. Here, he's doing more reps with less weight. If you find a type of lift that you love a lot and that gets you a ton of gains, a way to add a variation to it without actually modifying the lift at all is just to modify the rep range. That way you modify the intensity and volume, it's still the same lift, but it's going to allow you to do a type of double progression that is going to allow you to keep making gains for longer. As is usual for him, he then moves on to a different variation of the press. Before he did the behind the neck of red press, but he did it with less weight. This time he's doing dumbbell incline press. This one is going to hit the upper chest more. 5x5 five five with 44 kilograms, so he doesn't even take weight off, it's still the same rep range. But with a slight modification of the angle, he manages to actually use muscles that were not touched beforehand. And he finishes the pull-ups. I told you 10 sets on the pull-ups with the fat neutral grip. He still has 5 sets to go. This is when he finishes them. He follows up here with a chest supported barbell row. This one is a lift that I also included in my lat tier list that is rarely seen. He does a 10 by 10 on this. That's, that's bananas volume. But why does it work here? It works because it's not an upper body lift. It's not an upper back movement that is going to tax the lower back. If you did a 10 by 10 with barbell rows, I would say it's idiotic because the stimulus to fatigue ratio is garbage. Here, the only thing working in reality is going to be the upper back. And then he does another type of incline dumbbell press for 10 sets. So if you count that, five sets of dumbbell press, five sets of incline press, 10 total. So it's a total of 20. That's insane, 20 sets of presses with moderately high volume for that day. I think that for no one that is watching this video right now, this makes sense. It makes no sense to me whatsoever either, but he's gotten to a point in his lifting journey where he actually manages to handle that. I would say that for you, you should not be doing this because it's going to be junk volume, it's going to aggravate your joint. But you see the way he does it is smart. He does it with 40 kilograms this time, and this one is going to actually recruit a lot more chest than it does shoulders. So he starts with the one that taxes the shoulder the most, then the one that taxes the shoulder medium intensity, and then the one that actually deloads the shoulder. It still is a shoulder movement, but he does it in a way that is going to allow to do a ton of presses relatively safely. I say relatively safely also because I think that between vertical and horizontal presses, horizontal presses because of the angle of the scapula tends to be the one that destroys shoulders the most. You hear people get injured on the bench more often than the overhead press. Here we see that as well. He is able to spam vertical presses. If you replaced all of these vertical presses with horizontal presses, it would be impossible. You would eventually get an obvious injury in your shoulder. But one thing that needs to be pointed out is that it's not just that the vertical pulls are safer. It's what he does alongside it that also makes it work. If I did that amount, vertical presses or not, I would get injured. He does, in between all of these reps, however, all of these bent pull apart, all of these face pulls that keep the back of the shoulder healthy. And more importantly, look at the amount of volume he does for the upper back. I'm certain that you've heard this myth, or oh, you're supposed to press as much as you pull, or what, what is it? You're supposed to pull and do twice the upper back volume as opposed to your presses. That, of course, makes no sense, because if he had to do that, he would have to do 40 sets on one day of pull-ups of horizontal rows. It would be completely stupid. But I do think that if you press a lot, you should also be pulling a lot. Any type of ratios of perfect numbers make no sense, but it has to be somewhat equal or else you run into imbalances. And if, you're, if the back of your body and your scapular belt in particular are unbalanced, you end up with a kyphotic posture with rounded shoulders, overdeveloped front delts, and you end up injured. So he is taking care of that. 
is not falling for that trap. And he actually doubles down on it because at the end of all of that volume, he does three sets of real dot. That's a monstrous amount of volume. But GVS also was doing a shit ton of volume. This guy is doing a shit ton of volume as well, which sort of, you know, shoots a hole in the theory of, oh, natties can't recover from a ton of volume. I've always found that stupid. I personally train six days a week, two hours every single day. I recover just fine. You can recover from any amount of volume as long as you do it properly like he does with proper exercise selection, but also proper intensity and frequency management. Now, he moves on to something else. Erzo starts with torso work, that takes a lot of energy, a lot of joint stability. Then he moves on to arm work, that is going to be a little bit more forgiving. This is great, this is what I tell you guys as well. When you schedule your program, it's a pyramid, okay, like this, Illuminati. What, what is at the top of the pyramid and opens the program needs to be the most strenuous. Then the lower you go, the more relaxed you will become, the more fatigued you will become. So you want exercises that are going to be easier. Arm exercises are just as important as torso exercises, but they take less energy. So he does dumbbell seated curls, four sets of six to eight with 24 kilograms or 50 pounds, and dumbbell incline French press. Four sets of 8 to 12 with 44 kilograms. That's a 100 pounds behind the head. For 8 to 12, this is not a, a one rep max. This is banana strong. I personally use 85 to 90 kilograms for the same rep range. And the guy is 30 pounds lighter than, than I am. So this is someone that is very strong on compounds, but also very strong on isolation. And you see that reflected in his physique. His physique is complete. Everything is strong. Guess what? This is how you beat the spider physique. You get strong on isolation, you get very resilient, and you do a ton of volume on isolation as well. Now we get into the portion of the training that clearly seems to not be a priority at all for him, which is the legs. He always ends his training sessions with the legs because he cares about legs less. How many of you guys can relate? We live in the dictator of YouTube fitness nowadays where apparently if you don't train legs, you're a bitch. I say train legs if you want to train them. Train them minimally, train them once a week. Not everyone wants tree trunks. Not everyone wants massive legs like I do. He's not like that either. He wants a massive upper body and the legs slightly developed. Even with the way he does legs, you see that he skews it towards what he wants to grow. He follows that with snatch grip block pose. A snatch grip block pose is going to grow the armstrings and the glutes, but also the yoke. He manages to sneak additional upper back volume within the leg portion of the full body. Four sets of 10 with four plates. That's a decent amount of weight. Keep in mind that the snatch grip is going to also add additional stretch onto the yoke and the upper back and the real dot as well. And he supersets that with leg extensions. I personally love this. It's super smart and it's underrated. I don't see many people doing that. He does his leg extensions, by the way, with 30 kilograms for 15 to 25. And it's not the only sets that he's doing for neck. He follows with box squats. So he always tends to skew his quad exercises towards more posterior chain. He doesn't want the quad development that much. Four sets of eight to 10 with only quote unquote three plates. That's relatively weak for legs. But he supersets that with neck curls with two plates for 30 reps. Have you ever tried to do neck curls with two plates, two 45s? You have to do, be like this. You have to sandwich the plates like this. Look at the video. He does it like it's nothing. It's like baby weight for him. 30 reps. This is how strong his neck has gotten. Why? Because he trains it all the time. He prioritizes the neck development just as much as he does the leg and posture chain development and the results show themselves. It's, exa it's exactly the way you should train if you want a bigger neck. And then he finishes with an exercise that is more of a recovery thing, I guess, of back extensions, four sets, of 20 to 30 reps, which is why I said it's not necessarily for hypertrophy with 60 kilograms. So he's doing that for the health of the lower back to pump some blood into the glutes, the arm strings, and keep everything nice and healthy. Clearly, this guy focuses more on his posterior chain than he does his quads. Same for the chest. Look at that day. The chest is pretty much ignored. He does a shit ton of shoulder volume, but the chest is not that important apparently. And this trend continues. When we move on to the third full body session, he opens with the now infamous vertical press plus vertical pull. Deficit handstand push-ups, 10, 10 sets of 4 to 6, probably the best uh, body weight movement for shoulders in existence, and fat grip weighted pull-ups. I'm going to present them to you at this point, you understand. He is addicted to them. 
But this day is interesting because it's more of an arm focused day. Usually he would do back offsets for the shoulders and upper back, but this time he takes a step back and he starts doing cheat curls and weighted dips. So biceps and triceps for his second sets, no compounds, he jumps straight into isolation. Look at the rep range for the cheat curls, four sets, five sets of four to six is very intense with 60 kilograms. Same for the weighted dips. Then he does more arm work, even more. So he did his primary bicep and tricep movement. Then he does preacher dumbbell curl, four sets of eight to 10. The amount of sets is also crazy. It's always five. I told you in the previous installment of this series that the rule of three usually applies. Most people do three, so they do two to four. For him, it's more like five all the time. He always likes to stick to four to five, so he's slightly higher in terms of volume. And he pairs this preacher dumbbell curl with more French presses. You will see that the way he does them is interesting. He actually bends his back and he allows his thoracic spine to round around the preacher curl. He actually leans against it so as to create an arc with his arms, which tends to help recruit the tricep more and spares and alleviates tension on the tricep. If you like French presses, but you get pain from them, you should give it a try. Once again, 46 kilos, so it's a 100 pound dumbbell. It is crazy strong for that movement. I guarantee you that if most people manage to get that resilient, that endurant, and that strong on isolation, you would see much less spider physiques. Most people would have much bigger arms. You also find that uh, he favors certain types of movement, especially for the bicep, that are extremely strict. The seated dumbbell curl, the preacher dumbbell curl, but he's not afraid of throwing in some cheat curls once in a while. Now, it wouldn't be Erzo if he stopped there. Of course, he's going to try and sneak in some more shoulder work at this point of the workout. So he does three sets of cable shoulder raises circuits. Well, he doesn't count the reps. He just goes to failure. He does three different types of angles for shoulder elevations, and he does three sets of each for each arm. That's free volume, not going to tax the rotator cuff, not going to damage your ability to press. This is not someone that got big shoulders by spamming lateral raises. He does tons of presses. That's the way to go. I believe that's the way to go. He always prioritizes the compounds. The shoulder raises come always afterwards. And then we look at legs. So legs always tucked at the end of the workout. He does back squat with 110 kilos, so not that much. He does them, however, for three to five reps, 10 sets and 45 second rest in between. So that's very low rest. But it's still a lot of send back because you do 10 sets with the same weight and the same reps. And you follow with snatch grip high pulls, five by five, uh, sorry, five by five to eight, 100 kilograms plus neck work. So once again, he's training posterior chain, but he's also putting the accent on the yoke, on the upper back. Look at the type of sets he send bags and the ones that he doesn't. And you will notice that he tends to send back legs the most because he's not that interested in actually growing them. This is a split, as I said, that you can tell is from someone who knows what they're doing, but also someone who has a strong identity. His identity as a lifter transpires through these lines. You can tell immediately that this is someone that has a clear idea of a goal body in his mind and he skewed the full body split exactly towards that which is why I really do not recommend that you guys follow his full body split. It is way too much volume for presses, you're going to get injured. Way too much volume for vertical pulls, you're never going to be able to recover. Your upper back and your shoulders do not possess the ability to handle that. Then on the flip side, for most people, that's not enough chest volume, it's not enough legs volume. The only thing that I think would apply to most lifters is the way he trains arms. That you can copy, but for the rest, Instead, try to copy his mindset and not the way his split is actually scheduled. If you want to access a more balanced Silver Era program, if you're the type who loves Steve Reeves and who wants to resemble him, I actually created a Steve Reeves program. It's in the description you can find. It is much more balanced for most people. It's going to make much more sense for the average person and you'll be able to make modifications to the split directly so as to actually replicate a split that is going to lead you to your goal body. This is way too specialized. If you try to modify this, it's the equivalent of buying like a tailored shirt for someone who's seven feet tall and trying to tailor it down to your size instead of buying a normal size shirt then tailoring this. I hope that this makes sense. I tell you this because 
This is really what is standing out to me here. This is someone who is actually special. I hope you will get to a point one day where when you show your programs to people, they say, what the fuck? How is it possible that you can handle this? Well, it's possible because I worked up to it and I built the capacity to be able to do something that people are going to deem extraordinary. If you want to be able to look at the way Elzo trains without a French guy rambling in the background explaining everything to you, you can access all of his training splits directly on his YouTube channel. He recently put out a video about his 10 favorite lifts for bodybuilding. I'm going to link it in the description as the first link. You click on that, you go into his playlist. There is a playlist called Four Training Videos. There's 15 to 20 videos of him training, but most importantly, explaining why he does things. He will explain it better than I can. If you liked what you saw so far in this video, absolutely go, go check it out, leave likes. And if you can, if you like him, sub to his channel. It is an absolute shame that someone with such a great physique, such a great resource for silver era lifting stuff has only, I think, two to 3,000 subs. I hope we can get him to at least double that. Let's, let, let's, let's make this a reality. Let's challenge ourselves. Let's get Erzoviak to 6,000 subs by the end of April. I'm certain that we can do this and you will benefit. I also hope it's going to motivate him to actually make videos. Erzo, tu as des choses à dire. Fais plus de vidéos. I hope that if you have a bigger audience, it's going to motivate you to actually talk to people more and make more content. I know you're a busy man, but you have so much to teach people. He has so much to teach you. So that was for the actual uh, analysis of the split, right? From my perspective. Now, these are the key takeaways that I get and that you can learn from the way Erzoviak trains. First and foremost, as I said, he tends to favor low reps, especially for compound movements. But he doesn't just stop at low reps. He pairs the low reps with high sets. That way he makes up for the lack of volume. He gets the best of both worlds. High intensity, high volume. Now, the reason why most people don't do that is because having the muscular endurance to be able to replicate the effort throughout the sets with the same weight is very difficult which is why you will often see him do back down sets, he lowers the weight or he chooses different variations. That is also a technique that he utilizes to get additional volume. He did the same with the drop sets. He always finds a way to get three reps in and three sets in, which is why I believe that this is why he likes full body splits so much. The full body allows you to get that done. Now, if you look at the static rep ranges, he has a mix of static and of evolving for the big compounds. He tends to like static rep ranges. Why is that? Well, it's because he sandbags. I've told you in the past that this is why I didn't like these rep ranges, but this is also why I believe it's interesting for me to present lifters in this series that don't think like I do, because I don't know everything. My methods might work for you or they won't. I want you guys to have more resources out there because one day one is going to match and it's going to help you actually find yourself. Erzo might be that for you. So give it a try. Let's see if maybe his approach to static rep ranges is going to be better for you. Someone like me who prefers low sets will naturally gravitate towards rep ranges that allow me, allow me to go to fire every time with more reps because I have to make up for the lack of volume somewhere else. He doesn't because he has the sets. He has to make up for the lack of volume of the low reps. So it's a balance, but we are both in between, right? Our goal is also both to get volume and to get as much intensity as possible. He also manages to get uh, away with doing so much volume because it's only on a given uh, amount of body parts. He doesn't do that on every body part, and he certainly doesn't do that every day. You look at his third session, he didn't do as much pushes and as much pulls. He favored arms. This is, I believe, also a big takeaway from his training philosophy. Look at the way he trains with full body. He finds muscles that he wants to grow in priority, and he always prioritizes them. So every session opens with vertical presses and vertical pulls. Every session ends with legs. I personally would never do that because I want bigger legs. So I would open my sessions with legs. It's all up to what do you want? What do you want to look like? He wants the silver era look with a bigger V-taper and smaller legs. So the way he prioritizes makes a ton of sense. But that doesn't mean that he neglects isolation. You see that the isolation always come right after the heavy upper body compound and he always pushed them very, very hard. And it's also evident with the way he supersets. 
So you can always tell when people have absolutely no fucking clue of what they're doing when you look at the way they do supersets. Because certain muscles go very well with others. As I said, vertical pulls, vertical pushes, beautiful. Something like legs and hip hinges, for example, awful because there are too many muscles that are going to interact. You see that here, he supersets pretty much everything except for legs. When he does superset legs, he supersets them with neck work, which is not a leg, it's your fifth limb or maybe your sixth, depends on how gifted you are down there. This also allows you to build work capacity. I guarantee you that when Erzoviak got started, he wasn't doing this. Progressive overload is not just weight on the bar. It's also number of reps and number of sets. If you look, and we're going to get back to that when we talk about his physique, if you look at the, the muscles in his program that get the most volume, they're also unsurprisingly the biggest because a bigger muscle is a stronger muscle, yes? but it's also a more endurant muscle. Please take that to heart. Now, let us move on to the physique critique. This is going to be interesting because I'm going to critique someone who has a better physique than I do, but that's nothing new. I did the same thing last week with GVS. A lot of the lifters in this series are going to have better looking physiques than I do and are going to be more advanced. I'm still going to try and be as objective as possible and give them advice if they want to listen to me on what they can actually grow, what they should do and how they should skew their training. But most importantly for you watching, I want to link the size of the muscle with the training practice. I want to see if there is a correlation. So let's get started. I'm going to rank every single muscle from D to S. So S tier is top, D tier is the lowest. We start with the upper traps and the neck. Erzoviak has an S upper trap and neck. They're both very developed and that's unsurprising. If you look at the way he trains legs, every time he trains posterior chain for the most part, it's also a sneaky trap workout. He's always doing things that are going to stretch the traps. So they grow tremendously. For the neck, it's, also, it's, it's even more evident. He trains neck like an absolute monster. 30 reps with 90 pounds, it's bananas. I've seen him lift weight with his neck that most people can't even lift with their arms. And he ends up with a 19 inches neck on someone who's 5'7". Like, the ratio is crazy. I think my neck right now is 17.5, something like this. It's pretty big. Imagine 19 inches. So I tell people that usually the golden ratio is to have a neck that is in line with your jawline. His neck does this, it's like a trapezius, which also explains why he has such massive traps. The neck grows alongside the traps. So superset, supersetting the two together also makes a ton of sense. Now, for the mid, lower traps and the upper back in general, I also give him an S. He has the best upper back I've ever seen in my life. His upper back mugs PD users. I know PD users who don't have as good of a back as he does, and that's also unsurprising. Look at the amount of pull-ups he does. Which, by the way, uh, a salute to all of the idiots who say that pull-ups don't grow the upper back or they're bad for, for lats. Go tell that guy that. Because pull-ups make up 70 to 80% of all of his upper body volume when it comes to back development. And he has the back of a monster. So, if you want a big back, follow his example. Weighted pull-ups uh, with Vardy, chin-ups, neutral grip pull-ups with fat grips. Just spam them, get stronger at them, get more volume on them. And your back is going to be absolutely monstrous. Also... Don't limit yourself. Don't say, oh, naturals can only handle that much volume. For upper back development, that's not true. The upper back is a glutton for punishment. Look at the amount of volume he does for that. I think that most people can get to 60-70% of this. I know I do almost as much as he does, but more spread throughout the week because I train six times a week. So if your upper back is small, it's most likely because the way you treat it causes that smallness. You are not aware of the insane potential of your upper back. Take a look at his back and understand that he unlocked his potential by training like a maniac. Now we move on to the arms. So oftentimes with people with very big torsos, they are going to be a bit lacking in the arm development. But for him, his triceps are A tier because tons of presses that trains the, bicep, the tricep and he is extremely strong on behind the head, head extension. So this is someone who didn't just fall for their compound memes, he also developed his extensions behind the head, something that most people should be doing because look at the result. His triceps look absolutely tremendous. The biceps, however, are only a B. 
they are quite lacking, and that could be for many reasons. The first one is that he has a short insertion, so when he flexes like this, I can fit one finger here, I think he can fit almost three. So his insertion is actually quite short, which means that the bicep is not going to be that impressive. He's had tendonitis problem in the past, and also, if you look at his forearms, his forearms are almost bigger than the upper arm, it's ridiculous. So, the forearms still the work of the bicep. But that also means that the forearms are S-tier. That's not something you're going to hear many, uh, very often in this, in this series. Most people have shit for forearms, but this guy, his forearms are insane. It's because he does a ton of direct work. Now, it doesn't look like direct work because it's not isolation for the forearm, but fat grip work, all of these pulls that he does, all of that stuff with like fat grip for the bicep curls, it skews towards forearms, especially if you already have the forearm as a strong point. So it's a good idea. Even so, the guy used fat grips on tricep extensions. I don't know what it does for forearms, but he is addicted to fat grips and it really shows. Of course, there's also the thing about genetics. He has great genetics. If you look at forearms, your brachioradialis and the forearm muscles insert at some point and everything that is not going to be actually included in the insertion is going to be bare. There's like everything here, there's no muscle. My muscles start here. For him, he has deep insertions. So the forms, they look like chicken thighs. Then the chest. The chest is a B. And if you look at his split, you're like, yeah, of course it's a B. He never fucking trains it. Yeah, he almost never fucking trains it, but it's not a D and it's not a C. He trains it just enough to get some results, but he always wants the shoulders to be a stronger point. He said it himself. And I know that it's a sentiment that is actually widespread. People don't like a bigger chest. They don't like to have a chest that is going to hang. They want something that is going to be smaller, so that it doesn't actually take away when you turn around. You don't see like the you don't see the pec rounding like this. They want something that is going to be flat, and they want stronger shoulders. You want that? Look at the way he trains. Look at the way he prioritizes. That's exactly the way to do it. Then there's also the snowball effect. The bigger the shoulder gets, the stronger it is, the more work it steals from the pec on horizontal presses, the bigger it gets, and the weaker the chest gets. Which explains why he's actually quite weak on horizontal presses. His bench is, I think, 110 kilos, something like this, which is, I mean, it's not horrible, but for someone like him, I would think that he would be stronger. I also know that he has a lingering shoulder issue that prevents him from doing horizontal presses, so that could be that, but it also aligns with his aesthetic. And his aesthetic implies that his shoulders are S-tier. If you look at his shoulders, they're capped. Once again, oh, nat Natis can have capped shoulders. Bullshit. Look at him. I can vouch for him being natural. And if you look at the way he trains, why wouldn't he have massive shoulders? Do you see the punishment he inflicts upon them? S-tier shoulders, absolute priority in the split, clearly vertical presses all day, every day. He's super strong on them. He does them with a controlled range of motion, which is interesting for the people who say, oh, you have to go for Rome. Not necessarily, it depends on the style. And he does a ton of volume. As I explained, he also skews some of his exercises so as to keep the shoulders fresh, injury-free, so that he can train them as much as he can. The same cannot be said for his quads, however. His quads are his worst muscle group. C tier, they are quite small. It could be because he had knee injuries in the past, it could be because he doesn't give a fuck. I mean, he doesn't want big legs. But you see that his knee flexions are fairly pathetic. Let's be honest, 100 kilos for squats is pathetic at this level. He knows it. He doesn't want big legs. It takes away from the V taper. I understand also that uh, it's not necessarily something that he can actually fix because he had surgery on his knees or stuff like this. So it is going to be sometimes that you are stuck with a muscle that is weak because the tendons that come with the muscle are weak themselves. And the arm strings are not that good either, because when you look at his posterior chain work, he works off blocks of all the time, he rarely pulls off the floor, which tends to deload the, uh, the arm strings, glutes, and, and lower back. Hip hinges are clearly not a priority in his program. Again, they are always at the end, when he's always the most fatigued. So it's no surprise that they would be small. But again, silver era. Steve Reeves didn't have massive legs. They weren't small by any means, but they weren't massive. The massive legs only came later. If you're the type that likes this look, you should also do the same. But for the glutes and lower back, I gave him an A because they're actually quite developed. And usually big glutes are an insurance policy because it prevents injuries. And also keep in mind that the glutes are the muscles that help you stay erect. And I'm talking like erect, like walking, not that type of erect. Depends on your allegiance. But uh, they're very important for longevity. If you want to be able to keep being mobile for as long as you can, you want to train them and he does train them directly a lot. So 
you see that with the posterior chain focus, right? He does twice as many exercises and reps for posterior chain as he does for quads. Again, these ratios don't make any sense. People tell you that what you're supposed to do, I personally don't. I do as much posterior chain as I do quads. But in his case, it's because of the injury. I also think that he used to wrestle. Wrestlers always pack cake. Actually, it's a little bit of a tease because I have a wrestling video that is going to come out on Thursday this week. But they always have big asses because they're always bent over and they're always in a hip hinge position. And then we finish with the abs and the calves. I gave him an A for both, even though he doesn't fucking train them. If you look at his split, just like GVS last week, no abs, no calves at this point. No one loves training these muscles. They're always ignored. But in his case, he gets an A. GVS got a C. How? Well, it's because he trained them in the past. That guy used to do martial arts and sports, in which he trained the calves and the abs a ton. So he, in a sense, can rest on his laurels. The muscles are developed. This is not, I repeat, this is not an excuse for you to stop training them because you didn't do that. He developed these muscles in the past and now he conserves them with minimal work. If you're like me and used to play Pokemon instead of being active and playing sports like this monster did, you're going to have to make up for it. I have to train these muscles for them to be good. You're going to have to do them as well. And that is going to conclude this physique and critique review. So tremendous physique. I think that's quite inspiring because if you look at the way he trains now, you would think, oh, that's impossible for natural is enhanced. But if you actually look at what I told you and you look at the way he evolved through the ages, it is very inspiring because it shows to me that if you have a clear uh, goal in mind, a clear goal physique in mind, and you have a smart plan, you're going to be able to get there. And I think, I think that most of you guys, especially if you resonated with this episode, would be able to learn more about how to craft a plan from this guy in particular. So please go check out, check out his page. And if you like what he does, absolutely consider giving him a like and giving him a subscribe. I think that he was supposed to release a video today as well. So it works perfectly in that way. And I'm going to leave you with that. The next installment of this series is going to be a subscriber program review. I already selected who I want to cover, but we're going to continue with famous YouTubers, people who I, who I believe deserve the spotlight and also more members of the community so that we can learn from each other. Have an excellent rest of your day and I'll see you on Thursday.